moving here among us. Today, we continue our study through the book of John, the Gospel of John, and our text is John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along as I read, or you can follow along on the screen behind me. John chapter 3, starting in verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And then they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony is certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord, that we can gather in the name of Jesus, Lord, in your presence, that, Lord, we can sit before your word, Lord God, the words of eternal life, that we can open them, Lord, and allow your spirit to direct our journey through your word. Lord God, I pray, Lord, for hearts that are good soil, Lord, that you may communicate to us and that your word may be received and bear the fruit that you desire for it to bear. Lord God, you have promised us that your word would not go out void, but would accomplish that which you sent it to accomplish. So, Lord, we thank you for that promise. Lord God, as was prayed, if there is anyone here or listening online that has not come into an intimate relationship with you, yielding a life that is born again, one that belongs to you and that is committed to you, our prayer, Lord God, is that you would accomplish that, your will, today by your Holy Spirit, that you would draw that heart to you, Lord God, and that they would surrender to you and be saved. Lord, have your way with us, God, because we are here for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. This is after Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus that we studied last week. We find Jesus with his disciples ministering in the region of Judea. Now, the Apostle John clarifies in chapter 4 that Jesus himself was not personally baptizing anyone, but he had commissioned his disciples to do so. So Jesus wasn't himself baptizing people, and probably for good reason. You know, people, as we saw in Corinthians, they tend to sectarianism. You know, they might think that they were special. You know, I was baptized by Jesus himself, right? So Jesus didn't do that. He allowed his disciples to baptize. 
Now, the purpose for Jesus' disciples baptizing would be the same as John the Baptist's baptism. It was a baptism unto repentance because this was not only John the Baptist's message, it was also the message of Jesus. Jesus' ministry began when he was baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Immediately after that, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights while he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Immediately thereafter, Jesus starts his ministry, and Matthew records this in Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this was the message of John the Baptist. This was also the message of Jesus. Repentance. Their messages were identical. What does repent mean? It means to change your mind. Do a 180 degree mental turn of heart and mind from where you're heading. Prepare yourself because the opportunity to be born again into God's kingdom will be coming. It wasn't yet. Jesus hasn't, hadn't accomplished the work yet necessary for anyone to be born again, but it was to be forthcoming. So right now the message is recognize your sin. Recognize that you need to be saved. Recognize that what you are doing, the works of the law, isn't enough. Hear my message. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again by the Spirit. So repent. Prepare your hearts to embrace the kingdom of God. So this water baptism that was going on was a, a looking forward to receiving from Jesus. Now that we are on the other side of the cross, Jesus, where Jesus has accomplished his work of salvation, when we are baptized in water, we're looking back. We're looking back to that moment of our salvation when we were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ. Our water baptism is just a testimony to the spirit baptism that happened to us at the moment of salvation when we were born again. Verse 23. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. This verse tells us that John's ministry was a success. He was preaching repentance and people were responding. They were coming and they were being baptized. Verse 24, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Here the apostle John is giving us a preview as to what is going to happen to John the Baptist. John the Baptist would indeed be thrown in prison for what? for preaching righteousness and preaching it boldly. What specifically did John get thrown in prison for? He was rebuking King Herod for committing adultery with his brother's wife. And he got thrown in prison for that. I thank God for our country where we have the freedom of speech a freedom that is obviously deteriorating day by day. There are those that would desire to make freedom of speech illegal if it doesn't agree with their speech, right? They, they, they want to define hate speech as anything they don't agree with. John got thrown in prison. It may come a day when your pastor might get thrown in prison just by simply saying, this is what the Bible says. We can't compromise God's word. God's word is what God's word is. We are called to boldly proclaim it no matter 
the consequences. We trust in the Lord. We do his will and we rely on him. So yes, John was thrown in prison and unfortunately it would be in prison where John would eventually be beheaded and lose his life. But that hadn't transpired yet. Verse 25, then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Now, we aren't giving any further information as the details to this dispute, but the rites of purification share similarities with that of baptism, and that is probably why that this dispute with the Jews was a precursor to John's disciples' question in verse 26. And they came to John, verse 26, and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. In this verse, we see a danger. You see, these disciples of John have failed to grasp the purpose of John's calling. They address John with respect, rabbi or master, and refer to Jesus simply as he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. See, they're indicating John's superiority over Jesus. Rabbi, master, this guy who came to you, you didn't come to him, he came to you. And you testified of him. You endorsed him. He didn't endorse you. And now all of these people are going to him and, and, and being baptized. They are jealous for their master John, that he is losing his ministry to Jesus. What's implied is, of course, not only what will happen to your ministry, rabbi, but what will happen to us? See, they failed to understand their master's mission, which was to prepare their hearts for this man that they are speaking of, who is far above John the Baptist. So John answers them perfectly. Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. John communicates his understanding that his commission is from heaven and also that Jesus' mission is directly from the Father. John was the announcer. His mission was to introduce Jesus and then fade into the background. We should all recognize that our assignments come from God. We don't get to choose our position. God does that. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit gifts us and places us in the body of Christ according to his will, not ours. It's a blessing to perform our assigned duties in the body of Christ, in the positions which God has placed us in the gifts that God has given us according to his will. John was grateful for his ministry from the Lord, and John was careful not to overstep. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John likens his, his, his mission as the best man at the wedding. John's like, no, you guys are wrong. I'm not jealous of him. He is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. I'm just the best man. I'm his friend. My, my job was to prepare the wedding ceremony and get everything right 
up until the point that the bride goes into the bride chamber to be with the bridegroom. And I rejoice that I am fulfilling my role. John is overjoyed to be a part of his friend's marriage. This is how John the Baptist felt. Not like his disciples who were consumed with jealousy and protection over their master's position. They still had not fully understood who Jesus was. John was indeed like the best man at the wedding. But John would also be the bride. Because Jesus came to pay the bride price, which was his very own blood to cleanse each and every person from their sin and to make them one with himself, to make them his church, the bride of Jesus Christ. John summarizes his point so eloquently in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Only six words, but so profound. Actually, it's seven words. I can't count, right? He must increase, but I must decrease. This spoke directly to John's disciples, concerns of John's popularity and following. However, the application of this verse goes far beyond John the Baptist's current situation. This Statement not only speaks of what must happen at the moment of salvation, but what must continue to happen throughout the life of the believer in Jesus Christ. See, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize who he is and we recognize who we are. Recognizing Jesus is Lord means that we understand that he has full authority over our lives. The Bible says you are not your own, but you are bought with a price. And oh, what the price? The price of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Recognizing who we are means that we understand that we are sinners and we are all in need of the Savior. But I'm a good guy, you know. I haven't killed anybody. You know, when, when God judges me and he looks at my life, he will see that my good outweigh my bad. My friend, you got it wrong. You're judging yourself with the wrong measure. You see, God is holy. And to enter into fellowship with God, only one or two things could happen. God can devolve into your level and meet you where you are, sinful being, or God can elevate you to his standard, which is perfection. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. God cannot devolve to your level. So Jesus came to pay the price for your sin and to make you as right as Jesus is right. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Our account is settled in heaven. When we come into possession of eternal life at the moment that we are saved, we are changed. Our sin is no longer separating us from union with the holy God. We have been declared as righteous as he is righteous. This is our position that is recognized by God in heaven. But in terms of our practical daily experience, we must undergo a lifetime of sanctification in order to experience in real time what we already possess in heaven. 
By the time we are saved, no matter how young we are when we give our life to Jesus, we have already learned the selfish ways of sinful flesh. It takes constant surrender to the Holy Spirit in order to experience the gloriousness of a life that is fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means that he must increase, but I must decrease. Every day, every day, the Bible says that you are dead to sin. And we need to experience that in our life. And the only way we do that is we surrender to the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love the way verse 2 here is constructed in the Greek. It says, be not conformed to this world. That's in the passive. That means you don't have to do anything to be conformed to this world. All you have to do is do nothing. It's like standing on an a, a escalator. You just stand there, and it's going to take you where it's going. In order to be conformed to this world, just simply do nothing. The world is conforming you. But then the next part of the verse is active. But be ye transformed. See, that takes intentionality. In order to be transformed, you have to intentionally surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to intentionally fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, intentionally pray, intentionally read God's word, intentionally surround yourself with the people of God in order to be edified and encouraged. Allowing Jesus to increase in our life as we decrease must be intentional. God will not force you to obey him, Christian. The Holy Spirit will convict your heart of sin when you are out of God's will, but he will not force you to surrender to him. You must willingly do that. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the spirit is the act of surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Cut off the flesh. Stop feeding the flesh. Stop giving the flesh what it needs in order to dominate you. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we dwell in his word and we surrender to the authority of God's word. Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John wants his disciple to understand the immense difference in knowledge and authority between himself and the Lord Jesus Christ. John wants his disciples to know I'm earthly. I'm, he's God. He is from heaven. He knows all. Verse 32, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. What Jesus knew and taught was the direct knowledge from the very throne of God. And John prophetically states the rejection of Jesus. No one receives his testimony. 
This accurately describes the condition of our world today. Deception and blindness are rampant in our world. People are so quick to believe the experts of this world while rejecting the word of God. We must never forget that this is because a spiritual war is raging. Ephesians 6, 12, and 13 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, in the heavenly places, just 12, no need for 13. It's a spiritual war. We're not wrestling against the people of this world. We're wrestling against the forces of darkness that are behind the acts of those in this world. The God of this world and his ministers are masters of deception. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. It amazes me, and I'm sure it amazes some of you as well, how we can see so clearly in the spirit things that others are completely blind to. Some things are quite obvious as they are direct contradictions to God's word, but other things are more subtle, matters of pride and flesh that may go undetected by those who are being taken captive by the enemy at his will. Deception. We get deceived. The only way not to be deceived is to stay in God's word and have a humble heart. Be willing to submit to the authority of God's word. Verse 33, he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. If you have received the words of Jesus, you have received the words of God, and you are standing in unity with the truth. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. God has spoken to us by his son, and God continues to speak to us by his son. As Romans says, let God be true and every man a liar. I love that verse, right? Let God be true, but every man a liar. There's so many voices coming into our heads from, from the world, from media, Run it all by the word of God. Let God be true. Because those voices are seeking to separate you from God's will. Those voices are seeking to get you to act in your flesh on your own accord, seeking your will and not God's will. Let God be true and every man a liar. Verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. 
Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. So let me answer a question for you. Jesus is God. So why would Jesus need the Holy Spirit? Good question. I'm glad you asked it. Let me answer. When Jesus left his throne in glory, he never for one second ceased to be fully God, God Almighty. But Jesus laid aside the privileges of being God Almighty so that he can walk this earth as fully man. And as fully man, Jesus needed to rely on his relationship with God the Father. Scripture tells us that Jesus never did anything on his own accord. He only did what the Father told him to do. And Jesus needed to rely on his filling of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. Those other people of God in the Old Testament, when they were filled with God's Spirit, it was with measure. We're talking Old Testament here, right? Because Jesus is still living in the Old Testament. We, we sometimes think that because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are part of our canon that is the New Testament, that the times spoken of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the New Testament. They aren't. They're the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant did not cease until Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again, and then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and ushered in the New Covenant. Prior to that, Jesus is living in the Old Covenant. And in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit would come upon God's servants for a time. David would have God's Spirit come upon him, but then the Holy Spirit would leave. That's why David said, God, take not your Holy Spirit from me. But Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure, just like you do. When God the Holy Spirit came to indwell your life as salvation, he came to indwell you permanently. The Bible says that that is God's down payment, guaranteeing that you will be in heaven. The Holy Spirit is with you. That's why Jesus could say, I will never, no, never, no, never leave you nor forsake you. God is always with you if you belong to Jesus, if you are born again. When you feel there's separation between you and Jesus, Jesus didn't go anywhere. It was you. You walked away. You allow sin to cloud that relationship with the Lord. But only, you're only one confession away from being right with God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 35, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. The father loves the son. God chose to reveal to us the relationship of the first and second persons of the Godhead as father and son so that we could have some level of comprehension about the intimacy between these members of the Godhead. If you are a normal parent, and I say normal parent because there are some abnormal people in this world, right? If you're a normal parent, then you understand the depth of love that a parent has for their children. Would you agree that there's some abnormal people in this world? Parents that don't love their children? Parents that abuse their children and neglect their children? But if you're a normal parent, you understand that tremendous bond of love that a father has for a son, that a mother has for her children. That love for our children 
is expressed in us wanting to protect them from harm and from even being uncomfortable. But sometimes the tendency to protect our children from discomfort can sometimes defy true love. Listen to me. Our children, unlike Jesus, God the Son, our children are tainted by sin. Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Sentimentality and worldly wisdom can prevent uh, from give, us from giving our children what the word of God says is required for them to be truly loved. Proverbs 13, 24 says this, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Those are some strong words, right? You hate your child if you don't discipline them because you are setting your child up for failure. That's strong words, but that's the word of God. To disregard God's word is to be unwise. It had to be a few weeks ago that I had to discipline my granddaughter. If you've seen these little twins running around here, you understand how sweet they are. Tugs at Papa's heart. But a few weeks ago, she was told to put her trash in the trash can. She just flatly refused. No. I told her again. And again, she refused. Then I explained to her that she was expressing disobedience and that that was not right. And that if she continued the consequences would be a spanking. Now, reasoning with a three-year-old can be futile, <laughs> and it was. She refused again, so I smacked her thigh hard enough to sting and be unpleasant with her. It wasn't a, 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 a fake discipline. It was real. Amen. It hurt, and she responded. Those tears started flowing from her eyes. It was unpleasant. I asked her if she liked what I just did to her. She didn't. And I explained to her that if she continued to be disobedient, that I would have to do it again. So I said, go throw your trash away. Again, she flatly refused. She got another smack, just as unpleasant, with another explanation. This time, I told her that if she didn't throw her trash away when I told her to, that I would simply do it myself, but she would get another spanking. See, I didn't want this to go on for eternity, right? Because I, I, I remember how stubborn her mother is, right? And, and I'm like, if she's anything like her mother, she ain't going to do it. So I told her, if, if you don't do it this time, I'm just going to do it myself, but you're going to get spanked again. And I told her to do it again. She refused. I expected that. So I, I threw it away myself, and then I spanked her again, and then I picked her up and I hugged her. I told her how much I loved her. I told her how bad disobedience was and how important it was that I disciplined her. Now, Kellyanne was right there for this entire discipline. And she was crying more than the child, <laughs> right? Tears just flowing down her face, right? Because it hurts. It hurts. It's not pleasant for us to do this, but God's word says if you don't do it, then you hate your child. Now, since then, we have not seen that type of defiance in her, which is a good thing, right? But it is required that we discipline them because foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That's that sin nature. They're born with it. But the rod of correction will drive it far from him. All this to say that God, the Father, loves the Son. Last week, we looked at John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love for his son did not prevent God from allowing his son to go through extreme pain and suffering. God's love for his son and God's love for the world are not in opposition, but are in harmony. Jesus paid that awful price for our sin, but in doing so, he gained all things that he had surrendered when he left heaven. And he gained even more. He gained us. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We are the joy that was set before Jesus. We are the reason he despised the shame and endured. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So simple, and yet so profound. In last week's study, I talked about what it means to truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not just talking mental assent. We're talking about a belief that is profound. We're talking about saving faith. If you haven't listened to that message, I suggest you go back and look at what it truly means to believe. Because when you believe on Jesus, you come into possession of Jesus. Jesus indwells you. You are born again. And having Jesus means you have eternal life. When you don't believe in Jesus, then you're already condemned. We are born into this world separate from God. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. There's the first birth. It got you here. But then it must be a spiritual birth in order to be made right with God because of your sin, because you were born into sin, because you inherited sin through your father, and then by your own will and volition, you willingly sinned, which means you missed the mark. That's what sin means. It's, it's actually an archery term. It means to miss the mark. You, you aim for the bullseye and you miss. God set the bullseye as being perfect holiness, perfection, and we all miss the mark. That's why Jesus had to come and shed his blood for us. It's quite simple. Recognize that you are a sinner and get the help that you need. Go to Jesus, receive the free gift. He paid the price, right? We don't have to do anything. When, when I receive a gift, I didn't purchase it. That's what a gift is, right? Somebody else paid for it, and then they give it to me, and I accept it. I receive it. Jesus paid the price. The gift is himself, eternal life, and all you have to do is receive it and be saved. 
Let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you, Lord God, that you shed your precious blood on Calvary's tree, Lord, that you suffered like no man has ever suffered or will ever suffer because you paid the price for each one of our sins. And you invite us, Lord, to come into a right relationship with you. And those of us who have come into that relationship, Lord, can testify that we had no life before we came to you. We would never want to go back to what we were before we came into a relationship with you, Lord, because the joy, the peace, the serenity that fills our hearts, dear God, when we are walking with you when we are right with you. Lord, I want to offer that invitation to anyone that has yet to experience that. If you are here today or if you are listening online and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, if he's tugging on you and letting you know you're not right with me, you're outside of a relationship with me, you're under condemnation, but I die for you, I want to invite you to open your heart and receive him. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to make that profession of faith, I'm going to ask you right now while we're praying in the privacy of bowed heads and closed eyes to raise your hand and let me acknowledge your hand and pray with you to receive Jesus. Is there any here that needs to receive the Lord? If you're listening online, obviously I can't see your hand. But God sees your heart, and it's your heart is what matters. God knows if you're crying out to him, and he's ready to respond. Simply be willing to turn from doing things your own way and receive the Lord, and he will receive you to himself. A simple prayer from the heart like this. Lord Jesus, I, I, I do believe that you shed your blood on the cross for me. I believe, Lord, that you have the right to rule my life and I want to receive you as my savior. So please, come into my life and be my Lord. Save me, change my heart so I can know that I belong to you. An honest prayer from the heart like that will result in you being born again. For those of us who are born again and know Jesus, Sometimes we allow selfishness and pride to get in the way of our walk where God causes us to stray. But like I said earlier, if we sin and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now is the time to get right with God. Submit yourself to him, to his word, to his will. And God will fill you again with this spirit. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word, Lord. Continue to work in us and through us and have your way with us. We're looking for your soon return, Lord. And we love you. We commit all things into your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand with us in a...